So I'm not exactly sure if this is a skinwalker thing or if this is something else entirely. But first, a little bit of background on me. I and my brother live with my dying grandfather, who is just far too sick to be by himself, which is why him and I are staying with him to take care of him. My grandfather lives kind of out and about, in the middle of nowhere, near Ute Reservations in Colorado. Around his property, there's lots of space to hike, hang out, and go ATVing. My brother and I's father passed away when we were both very young. We're only three years apart, and he died when he was five, and I was only two. I don't have much memory of him. In fact, he was kind of an alcoholic and was in and out of our lives, so my brother doesn't retain much memory either, other than a few old photographs here and there. Luckily for us, our grandfather stepped in and has raised us ever since, and he has been more of a father figure than my real dad could have ever been, which is why we opted to stay and take care of him while he's been deathly sick. With my career, I can work anywhere as long as I have a laptop and an internet connection, and my brother is out of work at the moment, so I'm kind of supporting us three, just until my grandfather gets better. Enough about us. Now onto what we suspect is a skinwalker around the house and the area. A couple of days ago, my brother was ATVing not too far away from the house and said he spotted a tall hooded figure or what appeared to be hooded with what appeared to be antlers or maybe some sort of ancient headdress like an old chief would wear or somebody who was into magic in the native culture. I know there's a Ute reservation not more than 50 miles away from here, so I don't know if that has anything at all to do with this. But it gets even stranger. About two or three weeks before Christmas this last year, we would always hear strange sounds outside the house. There's really no neighbors around, and in Colorado, at least in the area we are, we don't really get much snow, which is nice. But that doesn't mean the Colorado winters aren't safe. We've had some pretty extreme low temperatures, but nothing I don't feel like us three can handle. I almost wonder if that has anything to do with what we're seeing. Like, maybe the cold weather is bringing this thing around, since we only started seeing it in the past couple of months. Or, mainly my brother has. I've only seen or heard it a handful of times, mainly just hearing it. Back just before Thanksgiving, this would have been the very first time I had ever heard of anything like it outside the house. My grandfather had spent a few days in the hospital, and no, this was not COVID-related. So, me and my brother played house-sitter for three days until he returned. We would be visiting him frequently to check in on him, make sure he was doing well, and he had everything he needed. But we didn't want to be burdensome and let him get his rest. So we would return, and he could always shoot us a text message anytime he wanted our company, which was fine by me. We spent a lot of time getting fresh air, relaxing, and just doing what we do. Until nighttime. Sometimes, I can't speak for my brother. I didn't like hanging outside at night. I still don't. I kind of get this eerie feeling. Maybe not so much that I'm being watched, but that some sort of dangerous animal is around. I can't quite describe the feeling. Like there's something out in the darkness that's going to get me. So I try and stay inside as soon as sundown begins. Even if it comes to taking out the trash, I try and keep the canisters close to the house for that reason alone. But during those few days in the hospital, I woke up to some really weird noises coming outside the house. It sounded like everything from a wolf to a hyena to an elephant making huge stomping noises, and almost every other animal in between. Except it didn't sound right. It was weird and distorted, as if an animal was like morphing into another and changing, followed by howls and cries of pain. It was one of the most disturbing things I've ever heard in my life, coming from an animal. My brother, of course, didn't hear it, since he sleeps like a rock, and it woke me up out of a dead sleep and I was far too afraid to actually go check and see what it was. I can't remember if it was the following night, 
or maybe the night after the next. But then there was tapping on the windows, dragging something sharp and metal along the side of the house that when I checked did not leave any markings or any tracks, so I don't know what it could have been. It was high up, maybe five or six feet off the ground, and where my bedroom is in the house, it's at one of the corners, so the sound was dragging right against my wall on the other side. Something was out there, and whatever it was didn't pass by my window, like it was smart enough to not be seen. If I told other people this, they would probably tell me that somebody is messing with me. The only problem is that there is nobody else around for miles and miles. Remember how I said he doesn't have any neighbors? Well, that's true. I think the nearest person is five, six miles away. Yeah, my grandfather's pretty much out there. I'm very fortunate that I at least get cell service, even if it's not the best. It allows me to still remain in contact with the world. Then, the very next day, when my grandfather was brought back to his house, it all just stopped. The weird feelings outside at night, the noises. I don't know what the correlation is, but it's strange. Maybe about 10 or 12 days later, I remember it was right before December started, and my brother and I decided to go on a hike during the day. What we found was also very disturbing. Three to four dead does. Nothing was wrong with them. They looked like they had just dropped dead from where they were standing, and they were all within five to six feet of each other. My brother and I, thinking it was as strange as can be, took our time to observe the bodies because the manner in which they died, the position they were on the ground at, and the fact that they were all close to each other just didn't really make sense. They weren't lying on their side like you'd expect to see from a deer. They almost appeared to be as if they collapsed on all fours. It's hard to explain. There was no bullet wounds, no puncture marks, and they also appeared to have been dead for a little while, maybe a day at most, and even no signs of rigor mortis or anything. They were still very soft. Even though the weather's cold, there still should be some signs of decay setting in. We don't know if this has anything to do with the things that have been happening, but it was only about a mile and a half and away from the house, the same direction my brother recently went ATVing in and saw that humanoid shape with what he saw was either a headdress or antlers. Anyhow, I figured if anybody could, you out of everybody could debunk these theories and maybe see if they're real or not. Or maybe somebody truly is messing with us but why would they make the effort to come all the way out here? And what would the incentive be? We have nothing to offer. My grandfather isn't exactly rich, so there's really nothing they can get from him. Money, items. My brother and I don't have a lot either. That includes money and materials. There's nothing around the property of worth either. No valuables, tools, cars, assets. So I'm not quite sure what the incentive would be if it truly was a person, and why they would be pursuing this whole thing this long. Or maybe it's possible that this is indeed something supernatural, like a skinwalker, or some other native creature from lore, of which I'm not sure. I thought only Navajo had skinwalkers. Maybe I am wrong. Five years ago, I was living north outside of Sacramento, California, and was very close friends with a couple of natives around that area. Well, one didn't really believe in any of the folklore or legend of his tribe or people, and one night he was driving back home, and he said he saw some sort of wolf-like creature, except it was huge on all fours, and the head he described it to me as looking like a skull with horns and antlers. Kind of like a buck does, but more evil, he said. The horns weren't like that of an antler. They were sharper, more angled, and protruding far more than antlers ever would, in one direction. It was wicked, he said. The thing also had dull yellow eyes set far back in the skull head that he described. 
like they were tiny glowing yellow embers set in the black holes of the eye sockets of the skull. It crossed the road, looked over at his car, and then casually walked to the other side. He said he was terrified, and didn't tell me this till about a few weeks after, because here's what happened after he saw this thing that night. He began hearing his name being called outside his window every night, the voice of his dead mother, whom passed back when he was 12 years old, and it's been haunting him ever since. He's told me that he'll be laying in bed some nights, and he'll hear his mother's voice calling him from out of the woods, or from far away, and he looks at his window, and he can't see anything, but he just describes to me this terrible feeling, like he knows if he steps foot outside to follow where the voice is coming from, something really bad is going to happen to him, and he has to resist every time. But he said that it gets worse. There's almost, and these are his words, not mine, that there's almost like a supernatural force drawing him to come toward the voice, like it's pulling him, not just out of curiosity, but there is a force dragging him, making him come towards the forest, and he has to resist every time. He described it to me as being almost like in a trance where you have no control over your body and your mind, and you just find yourself doing it out of sheer reaction, like your own control is not even valid. This was all going down about mid to late 2016. In 2018, I ended up moving out of state, but kept contact with him and my other friends as well. For the story, I'll call him Sean. Many of my other friends, and it just so happened to be my friend's circle, were also native of the same tribe. They never had any issues, and growing up like I did, they weren't really immersed in their own culture, language, or folklore. Either was Sean, but Sean could not refute what had happened to him. He couldn't dismiss what was going on to him now. The other friends we hung about, which were also almost like cousins because we were all so close, they did not believe him, and he was often laughed at and made fun of, even though many of the supposed elders of the same tribe all had their own tales and stories, but maybe they were just seen as old wives' tales, or spooky stories to scare him. I don't know. I still keep in contact with Sean, and he still tells me that it's happening from time to time, but it's mostly died down, especially since 2020 has hit. While I only know so very little about skinwalkers, I just keep thinking back to what he saw that night, and I almost can't help but wonder if that's what he saw, and now that because he saw this, in a way he must have been marked, which is why it keeps reappearing and coming after him, trying to get him. Of course I could be wrong, and I really don't fully know what I'm talking about, and I'm hoping you could hear my story and verify, or at least read it to your fans, and maybe they can provide more information. Maybe somebody really knowledgeable on skinwalkers and how they relate to following people, marking people with, you know, a spiritual mark and going after them. Because I don't know anything about that. But it's a very real possibility at this point. Thank you for reading. I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teenagers. I walk over a lot, since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't exactly a long trek, and usually only takes me about 25 minutes. I've made this trip dozens of times, and have even grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest. However, about midway there, it's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind just playing tricks on me. This day... I spent more time at my friend's house than I'd meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. 
I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was ten steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams that there is definitely somebody or something there with you. I froze, not sure of what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I don't know the best option in this situation. I whispered, Hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened eagerly for a reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my own voice. Hello? I began to breathe too fast, my heart pounding against my chest. I felt like I might faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, my feet feeling cemented to the ground. I could not scream, and I could not reply. My voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I could not pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello. Hello. It had repeated. So I screamed to stop, and I finally managed to tear from my lips, when everything around me grew silent. For a long minute, nothing had happened. The air was stale, and I realized then for the first time there were no typical forest sounds. No bugs, no frogs or crickets. Nothing. So I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. Whatever it was. I'd had enough and was willing to move my heavy legs. But before I could take a step, I had heard some rustling in the bushes only twenty feet to my left. I watched in horror as a deer head with very large antlers protruded through the brush. As it came further out and stood up on twos like a man, I took off. I flew out of those woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mother when I got there. I just went up to my room, lay down, and thought about what happened. My mother came in at some point, asked me if everything was all right. I replied yes. I was just really tired. I don't know why I did not tell her. I guess I might have been afraid of how she would react. I called my friend, told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. This terrified me, even more so. He said to call him the next morning, and he would explain more, and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. Well, that night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake, listening to every little sound the night brought. Around three in the morning, just as I was about to drift off, I noticed the air changed. The night sounds quieted. I felt my heart begin to pound, to feel uneasy. I laid there, waiting, pulling the covers up over my head, like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment again. Hello, I cried, and it was all I could do. I heard my voice say hello and stop it again. It mocked what I had said in the woods. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then it did something new. It called my name. Amy, my mother's voice. Amy, Amy, come here. Hello? Stop it! My voice again. For the rest of the night, the thing outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated in my voice what I said in the woods over and over. 
in the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally ceased. I fell into a fitful sleep. I woke around noon to my friend calling to tell me that he had spoken to his grandfather and could finally explain what happened to me. He said that there was a creature they called a specific name in their native tongue, or simply a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required, and that it had for whatever reason caught my scent and now knew me. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me, that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching in my window and then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name but drawing it out really far. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it in my house. This went on nearly all night. At this point, honestly, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is it seriously going to stalk the shadows around for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. I'm looking for somebody, anybody that can help me. I was just talking to my boyfriend about some weird stuff I saw as a kid. He's a hardcore believer in skinwalkers and won't say it, or even let me say it, after it gets dark, in fear of attracting one. My story starts with coming back from the store with my own family. In my village, an entire new neighborhood was being built. Mind you, I live in an area that used to have a lot of forest around me, which has since now been destroyed due to development and building houses. There was a dirt gravel road in the middle of the woods from the main road that led to a shortcut right to my house. I was maybe nine or ten at the time, and I distinctly remember sitting in the middle seat in the middle row of our family minivan, so I got a clear view of the in-between the driver's seat and passenger's seat. I was talking with my younger siblings, goofing off, and I looked up to see it crouched on the road. It looked almost exactly like the picture you get when you Google the rake. It had pale gray skin, freakishly slender, and eyes like reflectors. It freaked out and screamed saying something along the lines of, what is that? Both of my parents turned around, asked what I was talking about. So I burst into tears and saw it ran under behind a tree. It was so tall. I see it peek from the tree a couple of times and explain what it looked like to my mom, all while hysterical. My mother, of course, did not believe me at all and got mad at me for trying to scare my siblings. Around that time, I used to watch a lot of those ghosts caught on tape type of stuff on YouTube. I'd show them to my younger siblings, which resulted in many nightmares. My dad, on the other hand, said it was probably just a deer. It looked nothing like a deer. I still remember those eyes. When we passed by the tree, I saw it run behind. Nothing was there. It was completely dark. I thought I must have imagined it, until my dad told me he saw something too when he got home. He told me that he saw something out of the corner of his eye, but did not get a good look since I began screaming and he turned around to look at me. And to this day, it still scares me and I never walk too close to the woods at night. So, I'm going to keep the details about me brief. I am a Northeastern American from a Norwegian-German heritage family, and I am raised very spiritual, 
and have some ghost of my own. Yeah, I know. Laugh at that statement, but I do have photo and video evidence. Friends, family, exes, roommates, and a girlfriend that has seen and experienced them. My best friend took me to see a shame when I was a teenager, after having some activity. People call the paranormal and his father's friend a shame so that I carry a lot of good energy, and I attract bad energy all the time. Well, in New Orleans, when I went to visit my cousins, I managed to pick up a shadow. So far, things match up. Anyhow, I moved to Arizona, which most people know about the Navajo and other communities. Well, this is actually the first day that I looked, so this is new. Anyhow, Last Sunday morning, February 21st, 2021, nearly two days ago, me and my girlfriend were in my living room, playing a game. Well, we have been noticing my cat, Ebby, acting weird, staring out the back door all night, fluffing up from time to time, and just glaring at the door. Finally, 4 a.m. rolls around, and Ebby freaks out cowered in the hallway, hissing and growling. She doesn't make any noise. She doesn't even purr unless she is with me. She only meows when I make sandwiches because she wants to eat the lunch meat. So when she freaked out like this, it shook me, and Sam were curious and freaked out. I got up to calm her down, and I heard my roommate, Andre, wake up from the noise. I took a few steps to Ebby, when Sam cried out my name. I looked over to the sliding glass door that sits right behind the couch we were on, and what I saw still has me shook to this moment. Sam was bolting past me when I saw two blood-orange eyes staring in from the glass, looking right at me and Sam. Once Sam was out of the room and running down the hallway, the eyes logged on to me. Now, that is mostly all that I saw. I'm not a short or skinny man. I weigh 230, work out, and work in construction part-time for my main job. So, I'm not a small guy. But the eyes on this thing stood at least half a head taller than I. Maybe 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, I didn't see much of a body, and what made me run was when the eyes went down to about chest level and moved to the right. I am a self-defense advocate as well. I have pistols, shotguns, revolvers, hunting rifles, when I go hunting, of course, and my dad's AR. I ignored all of them. Instead, I bolted for the same hallway everybody else has run into, and nearly slammed into Andre, trying to figure out something, and pushed Sam into the bathroom, it has no windows, so I figured safe, and then finally went for my guns. Within seconds, Andre and I each had a gun. We called 911 and were in for the scariest seven minutes I have ever been in. I barely know anything about these witches, and the only reason why I call them a witch is because I don't reference anything Native American by name. I learned that lesson the hard way and I have never researched them. But when all three of us are cowered in a half bathroom hearing scratches, knocking, someone running on the roof, banging, and sounds that sounded like knocking on the walls, till it stopped, and we heard wailing from a siren up close, here is when things get weird. The police, as in more than one, showed up quickly. They said when the officer came to our house, he saw a figure banging on the side of the house before taking off. So he pursued after it, only to find that it dipped down the alley right next to our house. When he pulled his suburban into the alley, he lost him. The police had us answer questions, investigate the house and such. They left around 6.30ish a.m. Sam stayed at my place, too scared to go home. Andre called out of work and I went in later that morning. As I was working, my buddy Ray asked me what happened. I panicked inside, and was like, what? 
so I asked him what he meant, and he just told me that you seem messed up. I described to him what happened without naming what I know, and I saw outright. He wanted me to ride home with him, so we go home, and he asked how my herbs are growing when we were in my backyard. I just said they were ready to be picked soon. Why? Well, he didn't say anything. Just pointed at the trays that I grow my herbs in, and they're all trashed, picked clean. He only chuckled and said, You got nothing to fear. He wasn't here for you. He was here for them. One of you must have done something in the past for him to take the knee to scare you all. If we're his targets, it would have been much worse. With that, we walked the house, and he told me to smell the air. He said if I or anyone else was targeted, we would have noticed a rot and decay smell. Then, he found freshly turned soil and dug at it. We found a wad of dried corn husk near where the herbs were and said that we should leave it. Removing it is bad, but had no ill intentions. He then told me some things that I don't want to write for the sake of rules. But tonight, I am burning some sage and cedar and tomorrow I plant more herbs, specifically those that it likes, but away from the doors and windows so we don't get scared by him. Hey, what looks beneath? It's Dean, here again, writing you back with some more interesting stories. So, I got in contact with a friend, who also happens to be close relatives and friends to some Appalachian and Seminole in the Florida area. If you don't know, there are quite a few native tribes to the entire Florida Panhandle area. The Appalachian and Seminole are just a couple of them. But what I find interesting is their stories. This friend, when I started talking to him about the alligator man, or the half-man, half-dinosaur that I saw, that I wrote to you about, he started telling me some stories from his friends that they shared with him, all while they encountered in the old time in the swamps and Everglades. Things like old men shapeshifting into alligators, things of that nature, and they believe that the alligator man, or at least some of the tribes believe he is a cursed witch, while other believe he is a shapeshifter capable of taking on form of half-creature, half-man thus appearing like a dinosaur man, or like a half-man, half-alligator. I guess there are other stories about an actual clan, modern day, mind you, of evil shapeshifters living in the Everglades that transform into horrific-looking creatures, like the alligator man, for example, or lizard-like creatures, or worse, that are still active to this day. They take this form because taking that physical form allows them greater strength than in their human form, and they're able to have greater power, can conceal themselves, and invoke fear and terror on the innocent. And while I firmly believe the tribes of this region have dealt with this kind of thing firsthand, it's all just speculation, since we don't have any definitive proof. But these are kind of the best guesses so I wouldn't be too surprised if none of this information was that far off from the actual truth. Anyway, just thought this little piece of information might prove useful to you in your search for the truth. For my 25th birthday party, me and a friend of mine were driving up to Vegas. I had never been to Vegas in my life, and figured, since I missed my 21, 25 will be the time to fully celebrate. We were taking the 15 up into Las Vegas. We were maybe only a few miles outside of town. It was still pretty deserty. We saw what I think was a skinwalker. Not by the road, but off in the distance a little. My friend saw it first and mentioned it to me. I looked to see what he was talking about. And off in the distance was this really pale, thin figure. Looked to be in tattered black clothing. Almost kind of like a robe. Like a robe you would see from the Middle East. Full headgown too. And these weird antlers protruding from its head. It was very tall and very slender. 
maybe nine feet tall if I had to guess. It was out there, so it's just a guesstimate, but it looked very out of place. I didn't see any details, but it was just standing there. It very well have may have not have been a skinwalker, but my friend and I were thoroughly creeped out and could just not understand while in this heat and the desert sun and day while anybody in their right mind would be out there in the middle of nowhere, wearing dirty, tattered black clothing, like that, covering their entire body and a headdress, just standing there, being perfectly still. It was very creepy and very strange. I'm not really sure how to categorize my experience with the paranormal or unknown, but this was back in the late 80s, and I was on a little road trip across country. This particular event, I was staying in a cheap motel, just outside of Fort Collins in Colorado. I remember being woken up in the middle of the night from my motel room by a very familiar voice calling my name from outside my motel room, calling me to come here. Here's the weird thing. The voice was my grandfather, who'd been dead for well over 20 years at this point. It was very creepy, and I considered it either me dreaming or just a coincidence. But the more it spoke, the angrier its tone became, because I wasn't coming to the door and coming outside. And even weirder, it knew my name, or the person knew my name, whatever it was. I'm going to say thing, because it gave me complete sinister evil vibes. Like, I knew it had to be more than a person. There was just something not right about all of it. I stayed in bed, tried to sleep the best I could, and this went on for maybe another 10 or 15 minutes before ceasing completely. I checked out of there maybe 8 a.m., and I was gone. I didn't stick around to investigate or see who or what it came from. And that was it for me. Not me, but my grandfather. He has seen some very disturbing things out in Red Lake Reservation, which is in Black Duck, Minnesota. I am full-blooded native, but because of where and how I grew up, I'm pretty detached from my culture and heritage. Only knowing a little bit, but I have a very deep interest in the paranormal, and even cryptids. I'm not exactly sure what our tribe's definition of a skinwalker is, like the Navajo down in the Arizona range, but this is something else that's very similar. Like it, but its own thing. My grandfather would describe it as a tall white figure with large elk-like horns protruding from its shoulders, back, as well as head. He tells me, or has told me, he would always see it, wandering around the lower Red Lake. The Red Lake Reservation is actually one large lake. The southern half is called the Lower Red Lake, with a very small channel leading to the upper larger body, known as the Upper Red Lake. He's been all around there, fishing, living, and just doing things that grandfathers do in his time. He's seen this creature multiple times and has given off very bad energy. He told me that he believes that it comes from beneath the earth. I'm not sure if he means like from hell or what, but says this thing has targeted him and has tried and attempted to come after him. Calling out to him multiple times with voices of his dead relatives and even his dead wife and even his own voice and children says sometimes that he'll see it on the highway nearby, or even around his trailer. And personally, I think the most haunting was when he was trying to get into his truck one early morning, and this thing comes out of nowhere, behind the trees, and nearly approaches him, speaking to him telepathically, explaining to my grandfather he does not belong here, and if he continues to stay, this thing is going to rip out his heart said this creature was evil, had a face and eyes that were black, and had long, jagged elk-like horns. I don't know if that fits the description of a skinwalker, or what, 
or if maybe our tribe has its own skinwalker. I don't know, but it's terrifying to think about. I've asked my grandfather, too, if he believes it was a shapeshifter, someone who has transformed. And while my grandfather isn't sure, he knows one thing. This being is of dark energy. When I was nine years old, my older brother, who was 15, and my mom and dad, we all went camping for a week in Prince Albert National Park, which is up in Canada. The adventure was a blast. We had a lot of fun on the lake and just the area around. We did all sorts of stuff. But my story is actually my brother's tale. One night, when he got out of the tent, he tells me that he believes he saw a monster, which also appeared to take different forms and shape, according to him. He said he was out peeing by a tree, and behind the tree, not the one he was urinating on, but another one close by, a large wolf came behind it, and when he said he stared at it, he was frightened by its face. He said that it had a very human-looking face, the way he described it was half wolf and half man, and very striking evil yellow eyes. Said that it stared him down, as if my brother, peeing on this tree, had disturbed this wolf man thing. Then, it looked away from him, went behind some brush, and after about 20 seconds, came back out as a very large brown bear, with also a distorted face. This freaked my brother out, and so he ran back to the tent, freaking out to me and both my mom and dad. They tried to calm him down and just explain that it was probably just a trick of the dark and that he was just seeing the wildlife. I talked to him about it the following day. He told me about it in more detail, basically what I just told you. He said the face just looked far too wrong, far too human to be an actual animal. He's a firm believer in shapeshifters and all of that. I didn't even know what any of that was at nine years old. But the older I've gotten, I've come to be educated on the subject, and I do believe his story. He was pretty genuinely frightened. I mean, I see no incentive for him to make that up or to fake it. He had nothing to gain, and he was never a prankster, and never one to pull any stunts like that or make up stories or lie. So, I have no reason not to trust him. I am aware, though, that shapeshifters and people taking shape of animals is generally a Native American thing. I know nothing of the tribes in that area or the things they practice, so I couldn't tell you any of that. But I can tell you that it does sound like it might be a case of a shapeshifter to me, and it must have just been wandering through the woods maybe looking for somebody or something. My brother just so happened to leave his tent at night and go relieve himself. Maybe this thing or person was not too far away, heard him and saw him, and apparently was startled, then went behind the nearby brush to take a different form and shape, which my brother clearly saw. When I asked him about this, he just said there was no way that a wolf that looked very uncannily like a man, could go behind some brush and within only a matter of 30 seconds disappear and a large brown bear walks out, having the same distorted human-like face. It really makes you question the secrets of the wild and what really goes on in the forests when nobody's around. Maybe there's a lot more to guardians of the forest than we think. I like to think of it that many Native Americans are endowed a specific magic, and they're able to shapeshift and guard parts of the woods. From what, I don't know. And from who, I don't know. Why? Well, maybe they think of themselves as guardians. That's if my theory on shapeshifting is even correct. For all I know, he could have saw a demon. I'm not too sure. But the shapeshifter thing sounds much more plausible if you believe in cryptozoology and all of that. So, I wanted to ask you, do you believe my brother saw a shapeshifter that night? And what are the tribes around that area? What do they practice? 
Do they have any sort of skinwalker shapeshifter thing in their tribe? Is there anybody that could be considered a black witch and practice dark magic to shapeshift? Or do they maybe have any guardian figures that would shapeshift and protect the forest? I'm very curious. Please, let me know what you find. Thanks. I have never told anybody this story, but my brother owns farmland, which used to belong to a tribe. We have paths drawn up on the left, and that goes between some trees to a clearing that we made to put scrap metal and store tractors. The right path leads to a house, some 400 yards away. One night, my brother was walking the dog. She started growling and darted off into the darkness. After a struggle, she came back whimpering, covered in blood. He went after her with his rifle and found she severely injured a lone coyote. The coyote was close to death, so we picked it up, carried it to a clearing a few yards further to allow it to die in peace, since it was clearly near death. This coyote had stopped breathing after we laid it down. We didn't feel it was necessary to shoot it. We went in, washed the blood off the dog, and her snout still stained with blood. The next day, we went to the area to bury it in daylight, because this area is really eerie at night, and the backhoe is in a storage area, which has a very evil vibe when the sun sets so we don't go over there unless it's in the day. Anyway, we went to bury the coyote, except it disappeared into thin air. No tracks, no drag marks, but flecks of blood where we had laid it. Things started getting weird after that. Fast forward a few months, and I was lying in bed in the dead of winter, right around 4 a.m., I hear whistling coming from the storage area, and I know that nobody is over there. It gets closer and closer to my window. As I held my breath, I could hear it breathing on the other side of the thin trailer walls. Then, one of our big freight liners pulls up with headlights on the house, and I heard it disappear off into the night. The driver described it as having a goat-like face and twitched as it ran awkwardly through the trees. We moved not long after, and only returned to farm during the daytime. After that incident, you can hear the animals' wails at night and whistling. This started back in January of this year. I live on the front range of Colorado, meaning that once the mountains stop, it's basically plains for miles and miles. There are a lot of small roads and strange dead ends around these parts. One of these is a favorite of me and my friends, as it goes a long way out from the main road, with basically no reason for anybody else to be out there. This privacy is great for any variety of teenage shenanigans. Back in January, I got high in the back of my friend's car as we drove down the road, hoping to park at the end so we could smoke more. As I was staring out the window, I swore I could see the silhouette of a tall, strangely proportioned person running alongside our car. It was far out in the field, and I convinced myself it was just my inebriated mind playing tricks on me so that I would not freak out. I didn't tell my friends so it would not bother him. We parked there for a few hours, lights off, then went home with nothing else amiss. This actually makes me want to die now. Tonight, I was headed back out to that spot with my girlfriend, both of us in separate cars. My drive up was pretty uneventful, but there was some fog that made it pretty spooky. Once we parked, my girlfriend hopped into my car and was obviously super freaked out. Once I got her to calm down, she told me what had happened. 
On the drive up, she had looked out her window and seen a tall, dark figure, exactly like what I had seen about 11 months prior. But this time, it was just standing there, staring. As soon as she made eye contact with it, her car radio turned to static. She pretty quickly turned it off and hauled butt to meet up with me. I cannot stress enough how little she believes in the supernatural. So seeing her as freaked out as she was definitely left me a little on the uneasy side. I helped calm her down and then hopped out of the car to go urinate. I know, literally the dumbest move ever. But at the time, I hadn't remembered what had happened to me previously, and so I really had to pee. While I was out there, I felt like something was watching me. But I'm generally an anxious person anyway, so I brushed it off, as I was only going to be out there for like 30 seconds. When I stood up and went to my back door, my girlfriend looked terrified. She was staring over my shoulder, not at me. My first thought wasn't anything supernatural. We're both girls, so I assumed some creepy rapist had crawled out of the grass and was standing right behind me, waiting to hurt us. When I tell you I flew into the driver's seat, I really mean it. My flight reflex 100% took over. Once I slammed the door, I looked over at her and yelled. As far as I could tell, there wasn't anybody there. She told me that she had heard faint female voices coming from the grass, exactly like ours. We were in an open plain, so there was no way it was our echoes. Whatever was out there was mimicking us. The mimicry is what did it for me, and I knew we had to leave ASAP, especially as I deciphered my hazy memories of the last time I saw whatever it was. I didn't tell my girlfriend exactly what was wrong, just turned around so my headlights were on her car so she could get there quickly. Once we were safely away, I called her and told her my thoughts. We're both pretty spooked, obviously. But what are your thoughts on this? What do you think? I'm not sure if this directly relates to skinwalkers or shapeshifters in general, but let me tell you about a similar creature. So similar, in fact, it's making my skin crawl. I've just heard about this skinwalker, and I can't help but share my own similar story, what I believe to be a shapeshifter of sorts. Alright, so let me first begin telling my place. I am from northeast of India, very quiet and lovely, full of nature, and very distant from the eccentric part of India. The creature in my story is called the Kaibu Keoba, and my tribe's language, it means half man, half tiger, or like man, like tiger, to be precise. Quite similar to a skinwalker. Anyway, my tribe is in the state of Manipur. There are several states in the northeastern India, with multiple tribes in each state. They might or might not have this mythological creature in their folklore, but this story is one of the most famous in our tribe, among others. The exact famous one is about the story about this creature, with the seven brothers and one sister. If you guys want to hear the story, let me know. I'd be happy to share it. It's exactly how it's been told to us when we were kids, and it's very eerily similar to the Navajo legend. Although the creature in our story is just one guy, one creature, instead of multiple, who was a famous medicine man who discovered he could conjure some dark magic to convert himself to a tiger or this vile animal and can change back to his human form. Also, I've, I don't know if it's true, but people in Thailand and a few other Southeast Asian countries apparently know about the story, but with their own cultural twist. But it does make sense, because in our story, it ends with the creature running away 
chased away to the south of our state, and it's quite likely it found a new home in those countries. But now that I know that skinwalkers in the West existed, or exists, it's debatable by most. I think my story gives a whole new perspective to its existence, and its widespread activity all around the world. Anyway, I'll just tell the story. It goes like this. The creature was only feeding on farm animals and other jungle animals. It soon grew tired of it, and grew hungrier and hungrier for heavier meat, like human. So one very rainy night, it made its way to the settlements and decided to eat easy prey. In this case, an older woman who had lived there, which happens to be the neighbor of the seven brothers and one sister. But the seven brothers had left the previous morning for some work and would not return until the following morning. So the creature thwarted the old lady's door and grabbed hold of her. The old lady, out of fear, told the creature to please don't eat me. In fact, there's a young lady who lives just next door. She lives alone, and her brothers are not home. You just have to trick her by saying a password to make her open the door. I'll pause a bit to explain this part. Her brothers are very protective of her, and one and only sister. They didn't have parents, and their brothers were all skilled woodsmen. They fashioned such a heavy door that it was easy to open from them for the inside, and very hard to open from the outside, because the brothers frequently travel together to work in the jungle, leaving their only sister alone. Above this, the brothers and the sister had passwords known to them, and only them, that even if somebody knocked, she's just an earful away about this password that they used and told the creature. The creature thought about it for a moment, and decided if she was telling the truth, she'd live, and if she wasn't, she would surely eat her. The old woman assured the creature, and this creature made its way to the young woman's house and knocked. The younger sister was surely excited that the brother had arrived so early, but was hesitant a moment later. She asked the password, and the creature, in the best human voice possible, crooned it. She slowly opened the door. As soon as the sister could see who was outside, it was too late. The creature pushed in, grabbed a hold of her, and carried her away to feast on her in the jungle, where he lived in a cave. As it was about to eat her, its human feelings came over and saw how beautiful this young woman was. It started having feelings. It told itself, I'll eat her after a while. For now, I shall admire her beauty. Days passed. She and the creature lived like a slave and master. And whatever the creature had hunted, the young sister would cook and eat together. She wanted to escape but she was too afraid of the jungle. The canopy covered the skies, and she could not find where to run. She had tried to run once or twice, but all the time the creature would come running back after her. After all being a creature, it could smell its prey easily, so she didn't dare. During this time, her brothers had returned home. They were shocked, and the old woman narrated what happened that night. The brothers then cursed the old woman, and they made their way into the jungle to track her and the creature. The brothers finally spotted crucial signs of its territory, and they made a plan to lay a trap and kill the beast to save their sister. One of the brothers thought up the plan. When the beast was away, one of the brothers secretly made its way into the beast's cave, found his sister, told her to give this bottle or cup kind of drink holder, to fetch water from the waterfall up the hill. Since it was far away, it'd take time for the beast to return, and the brother also slyly poke a small hole in the bottom of the bottle, so it'd have to go back and fetch water again and again. And by this time, the brothers laid a trap, so when the beast returned, the brothers would surely capture the beast and kill it. When the beast did return with some meager amount of water, one of the brothers trapped, tripped, and hurt the beast. It howled in pain and decided to jump and kill the sister. Suddenly, then the brothers did the same in front of the sister and swayed their swords and spears. 
The beast, seeing it be futile, began to run away, and the brothers, soon on horseback, began to chase it with their bows and arrows. They chased the beast far and hard. Some of the arrows hit it, but they could not catch up with it, and that was the last they had ever seen or heard of it in our kingdom. That's about the end of our story. As you can tell, even though it's just a legend, it's very similar to other stories, even passed around by the Sioux Indians of North Dakota, who also have a similar story. One thing is for sure, there appears to be shape-shifting all around the world. Four thirty a.m., February fifteenth, twenty twenty-one. I was driving home from a friend's apartment in a snowstorm. Woke up super early, and had the itch to leave, and being that I did not want to get snowed in. So it's four a.m., and I'm in downtown Indianapolis. Nobody's out, except for plows. I don't see any homeless. Nothing. I live on the eastern side of the city. And for those not familiar, it's urban, but not as any metropolitan. I'm driving very slow, of course, and very, very sober, I might add. So, as I come to this crossing, I see this wolf, coyote creature prance, almost bounce along into this thin alley, nestled between a coffee shop and a gas station. Here is where things get weird. Within seconds, I'm obviously passing the alley, driving slow, and looking for the animal. I do live on the outskirts of the city, and I do encounter some rather cool animals from time to time. So, I'm going like 10 to 15 miles an hour, super slow, to see if I can see it or any tracks. I peer into the alley to see a literal man, mind you. No human is out right now. It's terribly cold and snowing. Sure, homelessness is a huge problem, but I know what I saw, and all within a couple of seconds, I saw a larger dog, wolf, coyote type creature prance into this alley, only to drive by and see a very large figure of what appeared to be a man. The weirdest part were his arms were of rather Unusual length, like they were forming upwards. I can't make this up. He was almost stomping along down this tiny alleyway away from me. No animal in sight, and the figure clearly wasn't concerned about a wolf, dog, coyote creature like that would have been. Literally, appeared with long stick-like arms that almost looked like they were droopy. Some of the most trippy stuff I've ever seen. I know what I saw, and it was not normal. All a silhouette. It was very, very strange. The Navajo Reservation is the largest res in the U.S. It goes into New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. This story takes place in the northeastern region of Arizona, near Indian Wells. This was told by people from around that area. If you are heading west on State Highway 15, out towards Dilken, you come to a stretch of road that goes onto a small valley. I remember going down this road in my youth. If you looked at the horizon, it would seem as if the road kept going, and then suddenly, your car would be pulled down by gravity as you followed the road. It would always give me butterflies when we would go down the slope. When I heard the story about this road, it made my stomach feel different. A man was driving home one night, and it was very late. It was a drive that he had done before, so he wasn't too bothered by it. When you are driving on the res, sometimes there isn't any way to keep cattle from getting on the road. No fences means that you need to be extra aware. I was always told to look for the black horse. If you see a black horse, then you'll be able to see anything else that may wander into the path of your vehicle. So, this man is driving home, not paying too much attention. He drives down the slope, but when he gets to the bottom of the valley, he sees it. 
but doesn't have enough time to react. Suddenly, a horse comes out of the darkness. He slams on his brakes, but he is unable to stop and hits this horse with his truck. The impact was not enough to deploy the airbags, but the man was tossed around quite a bit by the incident. He turns on his emergency lights, gets out of the car to assess damage. The front of the car was crumpled, and one of the headlights clearly destroyed. He cursed out loud. This was the worst place to have an accident, and he did not have signal to phone for help. He then remembered the horse. The man went into the cab of his truck, got a small keychain flashlight. He then started shining around, looking for the wounded animal. He heard noises, but they did not sound like a horse. He was positive that he did hit a horse. As he approached the sounds, he could see the animal's fur moving from its ragged breathing. As he got closer, he began to realize what it was. There was a naked elderly woman, wrapped in a large pelt. She was moaning from pain. The man stopped dead in his tracks and got weak from fear. He stumbled back to his truck, and although it did suffer plenty of damage, he was able to get it started and drove off. Once he was able to get signal, he properly called the authorities. An ambulance drove out there and recovered the woman. She was driven to a local health care facility. And due to the fact that many of the health care staff were Navajo, nobody wanted to even touch the woman. The woman was apparently known in the community. She was thought to be bedridden. This was shocking because she was so far from home and the state she was in was immensely off-putting. She still had on her attire when she arrived at the hospital. The nurses called for her family to come. When her family got there, they removed her pelt and her jewelry. The staff were very frightened, but there were some non-Navajo staff that still provided her with care. The elderly woman had only bumps and scrapes. Other than that, she seemed just fine. She was able to get up and walk around the same evening. She went home with her family that same night, but after a couple of days, she passed away. In Navajo culture, if you find out who a skinwalker is, you have the power to destroy them. After the community around Indian Wells found out who, or more fittingly, what this woman was, it was for certain that her time was at an end. Okay, so I'll start off by mentioning, I live in Oregon, not quite a rural town, but our town is small, and only about a 10 minute drive to what you would actually consider a rural town or area. Everyone's heard about the cryptids and lore of Oregon woods. Personally, I hate these woods. They're just vast and terrifying, but at the same time tempting and beckoning, almost. I stay out of the woods. I don't hunt or fish, and I might go hiking once every couple of years with friends, but I make it a point to not go where I don't feel safe. I kind of brushed off all the stories about the woods here, until I had an experience of my own, and I'm ready to share with what I saw that night. My friend and I were graveyard shift at a local bakery, and so because of that, we always carpool. She picks me up at about 11.30 p.m. The bakery itself is in a more rural area, but the main road in town takes us almost all the way out there. It's a pretty well-lit road, until you get slightly out of town, and since it's the main road through town, even at night, there's usually passing cars or people walking, from my house, it takes about 10 minutes to get to work using this exact road. For about three months, this road was being repaved. We'd have to stop literally right before the turn into the bakery to wait for construction crew 
so they could finish whatever project they were doing. After two nights of being stopped right outside of work for well over an hour, an estimated date of construction being done, being three months out, we decided to start taking the back roads. The back way to work was on the opposite side of town of this main road. It took us all the way out of town, around the outskirts, and finally to the bakery for a total of about 30 minutes travel time instead of just 10. This back road was completely surrounded by heavy woods. There was a private drive to a house every five miles or so. No streetlights and no passing cars. No pedestrians even. This road was also extremely curvy. Just constant twists and turns. As expected, we'd see a lot of deer and the occasional possum, squirrel, etc. But this particular night, we begin our journey through the back roads just as we had been all week. We got about 10 miles through when my friend went around this bend and suddenly slamming on her brakes. I was on my phone, so I was not looking up when she first saw it. I look up and right in front of the car is this gigantic buck. I'm talking huge. Not moose-sized, but definitely one of the largest bucks I'd ever seen. He was staring directly at us through the windshield. We were just kind of frozen there for a moment for some reason. We both looked down at the feet of the deer, and in between its front and feet was a dead raccoon. It was clearly a raccoon, its face was even pointed toward us. Ringlets on the tail. Basically, a stereotypical raccoon. Except this thing was also huge. Now, the buck was large, but large bucks aren't unheard of. This raccoon was the size of a huge dog. Like, think of a mastiff. We looked back up at the deer, and it was still staring right at us like it was making eye contact with us both. My friend flashes her high beams and honks the horn and hoping to scare it off successfully. It does not run off. Without breaking eye contact with us, it starts to walk toward the car, slowly. We both are freaked out at this point and my friend throws the car in reverse, backs up, swerving around the deer, this entire time it moves its head to make sure it can keep eye contact as we back up, pull to the side, and drive away. We look back behind us, and this thing is just standing in the road, staring at us as we drive away. We finally went around a curve and lost sight of it, but until then, it never stopped staring right at us. We talk about this a lot, and how weird it was. I didn't think deer ate meat. I mean, I'm not a deer expert. I just assumed they were herbivores. So the standing over that dead raccoon was the most unsettling part, even over the constant eye contact. Luckily, we weren't dumb enough to get out of the car, but I always wonder what would have happened if we did. Since then, I've been more aware of the lore around here. I've heard unsettling noises and screams coming from the woods, but this was the only actual encounter I think I've had. Am I thinking too much into this, or is it a little weird to anybody else? There's so many legends and stories of cryptids around here, and I'm sure you've all read about the messed up stuff that happens at Crater Lake. Just thought this might be an interesting encounter for somebody to hear, since nobody really believes us. But it's hard to believe something you never saw with your own eyes. Went camping on a lake, and once it was in the middle of the night, pitch black in a field on the bank of the lake, my friend pointed out that there were glowing eyes staring towards us in the distance. This of course got my attention, and I assumed it was a deer at first, but the way it was staring at us, not taking its eyes off of us, started to give us a creepy feeling, as at the time we were cooking and eating food. The eyes were glowing bright, 
but there was no light, even by it, or pointing towards it. I have been hunting, and have shot and seen deer in the darker evening, but never remember seeing their eyes ever glow. I know deer eyes glow, but I didn't think they glowed in pitch black darkness. So, we decided to try to approach it with flashlights while stomping and yelling, just to try and scare it, or possibly get movement confirmation, but the eyes just stayed in place and did not react, which began to freak us out. So we backed up without ever being able to make out a body. We decided to start going back to what we were doing, while every now and then keeping an eye on the eyes. No one seemed to notice the eyes ever getting farther away or seeing them leave, but at one point, we all noticed they were just gone, like nothing, and we never heard any sort of footsteps or hopping away, as if maybe a deer had trotted off. We kind of wrote this off as a deer, but I always questioned because of the feeling we all got during the experience and the odd behavior. And then, I looked into skinwalkers recently, realized they are from the Native American past stories, and my friend who was with me has a lot of native blood in him. He is native to the point to where if you saw him and his features, it would make sense. He even has a card for his tribe. What made me post this story is that exact reason. Also, finding out that it is said that skinwalkers transform into animals, their eyes stay human but also apparently glow. After looking up glowing deer eyes, I was even more freaked out, because the eyes I remember seeing did not seem to be that far apart, and even seemed like they were completely forward-facing, and not sideways-facing like deer. And maybe it was a curious deer in shock when we tried to spook it, and maybe it couldn't see us well. Once we ignored it a bit more, we just never caught it walking away until it was far enough to run without us hearing it. What we saw, and what we thought about, not knowing the behavior and the appearance of what a skinwalker is supposed to be, and comparing it to the experience I had with my native friend, is clearly freaking me out, and giving me goosebumps. I'm getting chills coming to this realization, and goosebumps as I write this. What do you have to say, or what are you thinking of this? I am almost convinced I may have had a supernatural experience,